بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته On the second year of Hijrah the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم was instructed and ordered by Allah to change the direction of Qibla from Jerusalem to the Holy Kaaba in Mecca in the Holy Haram, the Holy Mosque. On that same year, Allah the Almighty made it obligatory upon Muslims to fast the holy month of Ramadan. And fasting, as we know, the month of Ramadan is one of the five pillars of Islam. Before that, Muslims used to fast, but it was made obligatory upon them to fast the day of Ashura. And that was before Ramadan became obligatory. And the day of Ashura is the 10th day of the month of Muharram, the first month of the Islamic calendar. And the reason behind the Muslims fasting that was? Uh, the day be, the before, before the Sharia came to fast Ramadan. Yes, why, why, why were we ordered to fast Ashura? Because the order from Allah Azza wa So mm. we are not, we're not have a choice. Okay, Al Salam. Um, was it to do with um, Ibrahim Alayhi no, no, it, 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 uh, Salam? No. It had to do with Moses. Yeah. It is the same day that Allah Azza wa Jal has saved Moses and the sons of Israel from uh, uh, Pharaoh and his followers. And they were drowned, and Moses and his followers, peace be uh, upon him, uh, uh, was saved from those who were following him. So when the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina and he found that the Jews used to fast that day, he said, well, well I should fast that day more than you. Because yeah. I'm closer to Moses more than you. And he instructed and ordered everyone to fast that uh, particular day in uh, 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 thanking Allah for that. Now, So we have to be changed or there is something different between the Muslims and the Kuffar or the, the Muslims and the unbelievers. Well, the Prophet Sallallahu at the very beginning, he fasted only the 10th. Yeah. And then he said, well, if I make it to the... Next year, I will fast with it the ninth, so that he would not simulate the non-Muslims in fasting only the tenth. He would fast the ninth and, and the tenth in order to be different, different. Uh, from them. But if you fast only the tenth, this is acceptable. We Though can say, we can say it's Sunnah is not. Uh, it's not obligatory, of course, yeah. because now with Ramadan, it's not obligatory yeah. any more. So Ramadan is now obligatory for Muslims. It's one of the pillars of Islam for them to fast. Also in this year, Allah Azza wa Jal has made another pillar of Islam, which is zakat. And, and zakat is the poor do, is the money that every Muslim should calculate from his savings, or if he's a farmer, from the crops he is, is farming or, or harvesting, or if he had cattle, sheep, cows, camels, and so on. Or if he was a merchant, he should calculate the money he has. If it reaches a certain limit, he should pay a certain amount, which is usually in uh, uh, trading or in if you have uh, savings, gold, silver, or uh, money, you should pay 2.5% of that saving every single year and you give this to the poor you don't give it to the priest you don't give it to uh, 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 the ruler unless because this is this money is concealed mm -hmm. and conceived by you he nobody knows about it but if it's something that is apparent that people can see like the cattle or like the farming um, harvests and so on then the ruler should take this amount of you and give it to the poor it's the responsibility of the government to feed the poor and to give the money and shelter to them. But if you have savings of your own, you're responsible to get 2.5%. And this system is the best system that would uh, take care of the poor 
on the account of the rich, without the rich being burdened by it, 2.5% is nothing, it's negligible every year, and the poor would find an, an, an honest and honorable, uh, honorable source of income without the need of begging uh, uh, others. And at the same time, that's good for the society to make the, uh, to make the people feel like br br brothers. You know. it's, it's, it's one way of looking at it, and it's a way of balancing things. Yeah. And it is a well-known fact. If, if, if this system was applied, you would not find any poor among the Muslims. There would be no poverty yeah. at all. No poverty at all. And it's also a well-known fact that you would never find Muslims dying out of hunger in the countries of Muslims. You may go places where non-Muslim countries and you would find people dying on the street. Nobody is willing to feed them. In Islam, it, it is impossible to see someone dying out of hunger or thirst without being fed because this is the normal practice. You feed the people that you know and you don't know and especially if they're in need, you give them whatever they want. Especially your neighbors, you have to care after your neighbors. Of course, this is one of the main yeah. things in Islam that the Prophet said, والسلام, and this is his teachings when he went to Medina. This is what he taught the Muslims, that it is not a believer. He is not a believer who sleeps while his neighbor is hungry. Yeah. You, you are not a believer, you're not a mu'min, you're not a faithful person if you sleep and your neighbor is hungry. Mm -hmm. So whoever has this faith and belief in him must do this to his uh, 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 brothers and neighbors. Now after the last uh, uh, expedition and detachment, Shariat Abdullah ibn Jahsh, where Amr ibn al-Hadrami was killed, he was a polytheist, and they took the two prisoners, and we spoke about that before, after this event took place, the polytheists, the people of Mecca, the pagans, knew that there's something wrong going on. And this is not something to be taken easily. We have to be serious and firm about this. So they had it deep down in their minds that they, ha they must attack. But they were anticipating the right moment. And the right moment came when the spies of the Prophet ﷺ came back telling him that the caravan that the Prophet missed in the battle or in, in the expedition of Dhul Ashira came back from Sham. As you remember that he missed one of the battles. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this uh, the, one of the caravans going to a Sham. It was filled with money and with, with, with uh, yes. things to be yes. traded. Now, it was coming back to Mecca, and it was, of course, full of merchandise. So, the Prophet heard about this, and he decided to go and capture and take that caravan to hurt the people of Quraysh financially. So, he asked whomever had his ride ready to come. And he did not want to wait for any uh, person who did not have his right ride ready with him. So he went off with a hundred of the muhajireen, of the migrants, and 214 of the Ansar, of the people of Medina. Two of the companions requested not to attend. And that was Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman and his father, because they've already gave their word to the mushrikeen not to fight. So yeah. they went off. And, and they had only one intention, and that was to capture the caravan. So they were not armed properly for a war. They just went off with the swords and maybe a spear or two. But well, they took the permission from the Prophet, the Prophet Sallallahu to not attend the, the, the battle. The two people? Yeah. Yes, of course. Hudayf from the Yaman and his father. And the Prophet ﷺ gave him that permission. Yes. Now, talking about the companions themselves, they were not going for war. The 314 companions yeah. were not ready for war. They were just going to capture a caravan. So it was a big caravan. It was a huge caravan. 
but it had few guards with them. So there was a chance. Yes, and it was led by Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, one of the leaders of uh, 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 Quraysh. So the Prophet ﷺ went out and he said, May Allah Azza wa Jal grant us as Muslims this caravan where we would benefit uh, uh, from. Now, as the Muslims had their spies and they had their people doing the reconnaissance, also the mushriks, the people of Mecca, had their own spies. Abu Sufyan ibn Harb knew that the Muslims wanted to attack him while going to Sham. So when coming back, he was even more careful because it was a serious thing and he did not want to lose uh, uh, the money that he was entrusted with. So he sent also his spies and he found out that the Prophet ﷺ was about to attack his caravan and intercept it in a certain area. So he changed his route, which means that he went off-road. Mm -hmm. Instead of going on the normal route, he went to the direction of the coast. So instead of going south, he went west. And he sent one of his uh, companions, Dandam ibn Amr al-Ghafari, to Quraysh to warn them. So Dandam ibn Amr al-Ghafari went to Quraysh and he was on his way, riding as fast as he can to warn the people of Quraysh about their caravan that is that was about to be taken by the Prophet and by the Muslims uh, uh, themselves. One of the aunts of the Prophet ﷺ, Atika bint Abdul Muttalib, had a dream. In her dream, she saw that a man came on top of the hill, shouting at the people of Quraysh, warning them, and he threw a stone, a big stone, rock, rock. And that rock, as it came down from the mountain, it broke into small pieces, and every single house in Mecca had a piece going into it. Her brother, Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, told this story, and this caused a feud and an argument, heated argument between him and Abu Jahl. Because he was a relative of the Prophet ﷺ, and this dream means that something bad was going to happen. And I'm afraid that we have to finish this story after the break, so stay tuned and inshallah we will be right back. <laughs> If you're 18 or if you're 80, if you've been Muslim for 50 years or five minutes, this is a show for you. You know, when five times a day I've, our foreheads touch the ground in prayer, we beg for what's most important in our lives. We want to be good people, better Muslims. We want to serve Allah Almighty with all our hearts. In this show, Let's Talk, every week we're going to talk about Islam and life, how to relate with other people and how to serve Allah. We'll have studio guests, we'll have a live studio audience. There'll be a, an email for you to write to, talk at huda.tv. So if you're looking for something different, looking for something that will make you think, maybe even touch your heart, this is the show for you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Atika bint Abdul Muttalib, she was the aunt of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Do you know any of the Prophet's aunts? No. I don't know. Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib and she was the mother of Zubair ibn al-Awwam, one of the great companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And we will get inshallah to some of the brave events she uh, took part in. Atika bint Abdul Muttalib saw a dream and she woke up not feeling very well about that dream and she told those who were uh, around her and 
the dream spread all over Mecca. The dream was that she saw a man coming on top of a hill, on top of the mountain of Abu Qubais, warning the people of Mecca. And a big rock rolled from this man as he threw it to them, and it started to crack into small fragments. And every house, there was a fragment that entered uh, uh, the houses of Mecca. When Abu Jahl, the leader of the Qurayshis, heard about this dream, he was not very happy with it. And he started arguing with Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, until this man, Dhamdam ibn uh, Amr al-Ghafari, actually came from on top of the mountain of Abu Qubais and shouted to them that, O oh, people of Mecca, hurry up because Muhammad and his army are attacking your caravan which has all your money. The minute they heard this, they stopped arguing and they understood and they interpreted the dream of Atika. Quraysh had to call all their knights and soldiers and brave ones to go and fight in order to save their caravan. Everyone went out. And those who could not go, they've appointed someone to represent them. For example, Abu Lahab, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, who was cursed and condemned by Allah in the Qur'an, sent a man in his place. And this is one of the things, as a funny thing that I just remembered, this is one of the things that proves that the Qur'an is the revelation of Allah. The surah of Al-Masad, where Allah Azza wa curses and condemns the uncle of the Prophet Abu Lahab and his wife, wife Umm Jamil. Allah says in the Qur'an that they are in hell. And that was like 10 years before the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina. Throughout these 10 years, anyone, if anyone wanted to prove that the Qur'an was not the word of Allah, Abu Lahab could have stood and said, well, now I embrace Islam. I believe in the word of Allah. And this automatically means that the Qur'an is not true. But for 10 years, he did not dare to say such a thing. Which means that the Prophet ﷺ did not talk of his own mind. It was the revelation of Allah who knows the future. And it is only Allah who knows the past, the present, the future, and the things that did not take place, how they would have materialized if they were to take place. Abu Lahab did not go with the army. And he sent someone else to represent him. Now, the previous expeditions and the previous uh, detachments were all sent by the Muhajirin. They were all migrants from Mecca. No residents of Medina ever went out. And why? It was simple. The pledge between the people of Medina and our Prophet wasallam was come to us to Medina before you reach Medina we are not responsible to whatever happens to you because you're on your way we don't have any protection for you the minute you reach Medina we will protect you as if we are protecting our own families and children so this meant that if the Prophet wasallam reaches Medina he is in the protection of the people of Medina, of Al-Ansar. And this is a label, this is a name. Al-Ansar, this is the supporters, means the supporters of the Prophet Wasallam, And it's a label that the Prophet Wasallam also gave the glad tidings to them by saying that no believer would ever hate the Ansar. And it's a sign of Iman and of belief to love them. And it's a sign and, uh, 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 of hypocrisy to hate them. So whoever hates the Ansar is not 
a believer, is not a mu'min, is not a faithful a, a person of faith. So the problem now was they went out for the caravan. Once the news came back to the Prophet wasallam that the people of Mecca are coming out with an army. Now, this is a different story. So, the Prophet wasallam gathered the people. And some of them did not like the idea of fighting, even among the, the migrants. They went out for the money. They went yeah. out for the caravan. They were not prepared to, to, to fight. So the Prophet ﷺ gathered everyone that was with him, the 314 men. And he said, O oh people, advise me, what should we do? So Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, and he's a migrant, stood and said well. He talked and said something that pleased the Prophet ﷺ. And he sat. And then the Prophet said, Advise me, people. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, said also something that was well. And he talked and supported the Prophet. We can learn, we can learn, or we can take from this point that the leader has to sit and talk and discuss everything with the, his brothers. Well, it, he cannot say he has to, but of course it is something to be, to, to be taken into consideration. Because if a leader puts everything into discussion, you will never ever get one opinion. The own, the, his own presence, it's not all the people. Well, in this case, it was everyone in that battlefield. But the Prophet had a purpose for that. And we will learn this, inshallah, uh, 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 as we go on. So, Umar also spoke. And then, Al-Miqdad ibn Amr, May Allah be pleased with him, spoke and said, O Prophet of Allah, do you think that we are going to abandon you and say to you like the Jews said to Moses, go and you and your Lord and fight. We are sitting here without fighting. No, we're not going to do this, O Prophet of Allah. We are going to accompany you. We are going to fight with you. And by Allah, wherever you take us, we're going to follow you and you should not have any problem with that. Sheikh, I want to ask you about something about the fiqh in this period of time. You said there's a war and battle. So how do you, how do you use to, work, to, to uh, pray, to fast in this period of time? Now this era, when was this? Uh, how did this take place or when did it take place? Uh, in Ramadan. In Ramadan, in the month of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. Because the Prophet left Medina on the 8th and some say on the 10th of Ramadan. So... In Islam, whether it's a battle or uh, something else, if you leave the border of your city and you're traveling, you are instructed to pray the four rak'ahs into two. This is known as shortening the prayer. And also you have the permission to join prayers. So you have the permission to join dhuhr and asr, each in the yeah. time of the other, or maghrib and isha, each in the time of the other. Uh, concerning fasting, you have the permission to break your fast and make it up uh, when you go back, when you are in, in, in safety or when you're back in your country. But if you want to continue to fast, it depends. If it's hard on you, then this is highly not recommended. But if it's harmful for you, then it becomes completely forbidden and if it's the same whether you fast or not then this is up to you to fast or not but it's also recommendable that you do fast so that you can uh, get the opportunity of fasting with the Muslims in Ramadan without the need of making it up later on now the Prophet ﷺ heard three of his companions but they were all from the migrants they were all from Mecca praising the event and saying and supporting the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ that we are with you all the way, the whole nine yards. But the Prophet did not want them to talk. So again he said, advise me people. So one of the Ansar stood up and his name was, was Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. And Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, he's a man of his own. This guy was 
the leader of the tribe of Aus. And as we know, we ha- there are two dominant tribes in Medina, the Aus Khazraj. and Al Khazraj. So he was the leader of the Aus tribe. And he was a young man. When he accepted Islam, he was barely 30 years old. And when he died, or, or even less, and when he died, he was almost 32 or 35 at most. Yet when he died, the Prophet tells us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the throne of Allah, the Almighty, trembled out of joy because he was coming to join uh, uh, them in heavens. Sa'd ibn Mu'adh stood up and said, Prophet of Allah, I sense and feel that you are talking to us and you intending that we talk instead of our brothers, the migrants. Prophet of Allah, we've believed in you. We followed you. And we testified that what you brought was truth. We gave you our vows and our pledges to support you and to obey you. Therefore, go ahead. Do what you want to do. By Allah, if you ride to the depth of the oceans, we will follow you blindfoldedly. So you, and none, one, not even one single man of us would stay back. So go to what Allah Azza wa Jal has instructed you and ordered you to do. And by Allah, when we meet the enemy tomorrow, you will see what type of men we are. Because we are firm when we meet the enemy and Allah Azza wa Jal will satisfy you with the way we fight. So the Prophet Sallallahu was fair to inform, to inform the Ansar to go with him. So he's the Prophet was, did not want to force them. Yeah. So they want, he wanted them to bring, them, to bring yeah. this initiative from them, themselves. And he prayed for Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for today's program. So inshallah, until we meet next time, fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.